Uh, greetings and hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 2019-2020 uh, PLP Pathways webinar number nine. Uh, our last three webinars have obviously been focused on the disruption that's happened due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And today uh, we're going to be talking about uh, things that people have noticed, some reflections and takeaways, uh, some of the end of the year transitions and rituals now that we have more information from the Ed Agency of Education. And then also we'll be talking about uh, moving forward, what teachers, admin, and community partners are planning for. I would like to thank the Tarrant Institute for Innovative Education and the Middle Grades uh, Collaborative for their support of this work. Uh, also at the end of the webinar, we'll be talking about some of the great learning opportunities that are happening as soon as tomorrow and extending into, uh, into uh, the summer. So if I could just have uh, our uh, contributors introduce themselves and uh, who wants to start, just raise your hand and you can start and then we'll go from there. Sure, uh, hi there, I'm Meg O'Donnell. I teach uh, humanities on a 718 at Chevron Community School. I'm Lindsay Hallman, Executive Director for Up for Learning. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin Peely Hunt. I teach on Swift House at Wilson Central School. Hi, I'm Maura Wheeler. I'm the Proficiency-Based Learning and Technology Integration Coach at Lamoille South. And uh, I'm Don Taylor, and I teach Language Arts and Social Studies at Main Street Middle School in uh, Montpelier. So uh, Maura, do you want to take us through um, our second agenda item? Sure. So um, when we had our last uh, webinar, we were just sort of at the beginning. It was a month ago. So we were just beginning our transition to um, the continuation of learning phase. And so I'm um, wondering from um, the group, you know, is there something that you've tried since our last webinar that either is going really well for you or that you're learning a lot from um, that you would be willing to share um, in our context of emergency remote learning? I mean, I can I can start. One thing that I've thought a lot about is the different ways that we can be engaging kids remotely. And so I have been doing a sort of a YouTube live. I might have mentioned this before in our morning meeting, and um, that that's working well. But I think when you start uh, diversifying your group size and you diversify the platforms that you're using, you can start to engage kids on different levels. And so one of the things that I've been doing, uh, we started this week was some very small literature circles with about six to eight students. And it's short, it's about 15 to 20 minutes. And we're using Google Meets to do that. And um, so that's something that I'm, I've been working on. And I just feel like uh, differentiating your group size and maybe how you're engaging those kids with, you know, what technology do you need? And I think the biggest part for me is the planning that goes into that because you need to be very organized and efficient and have specific outcomes. So really thinking about the planning and the different um, ways I can group kids to get them engaged and talking about some of the things that we're doing. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, one, one thing that, I've, that we've been playing around with quite a bit um, is using different applications on iPads for recording uh, parts of lessons or, or just even doing fun things like Flipgrid and, and for just uh, more informal check-ins. And for me, it, it definitely opened the door and just opened my eyes up to, you know, why haven't I been using this type of program more frequently to differentiate for my kids? Like when we are seeing each other face to face, cause it's, it's been amazing to, to be able to, you know, tier the different lessons, differentiate and be able to send kids their specific videos, you know, cause on my end, it doesn't take that long just to record a quick, hey, here's how you do this, or hey, here's a reminder, here's what we talked about when we met in class. Um, and just how powerful that is to have kids have that to go back to when they're kind of working on their own or if they wanna check in on something. Um, I thought, you know, that's for me, it's been the highlight in terms of, hey, here's something that's come out of this that we've had to use that now I think can enhance how we instruct moving forward. Um, and like Don said, having the small, we, we do some lit groups too, and having those small groups uh, just to engage them has been working really well. And having, you know, we, we do our morning meetings three days a week. Um, and it's, it, it's been awesome to see that, you know, we've had almost 100% participation every single one, um, which just tells you how much these kids are 
really pining for connection still, but it's, it's also, you know, again, a, a reminder that we can use these tools to help us connect, but they're, they're still just, there's no replacement for that face-to-face -face connection and just being able to really read, read your students. And, you know, we don't require our kids to have their cameras on for equity issues or equity sake. Um, and it's, it's hard, you know, to not be able to have your kids come into a space where they feel safe and just know that they can potentially leave some stuff at the door, you know, when they're home, even when teachers are home, like I've said this before, you don't get to get out of it, right? You're, you're living in, in your situation and, and it's not something that you could potentially forget about for a few hours um, while you're in a different safe space. So that's one, one thing that has been more transparent to just how important, you know, school is for, for everybody. Um, and hopefully, you know, go, going back to it in the fall, I know we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but I really hope that, you know, this is a great opportunity for us to think about what education is, what teaching looks like, um, and again, one opportunity for us to change things that, you know, it's, it's outdated. How we do things right now is completely outdated, and I think this is opening up a lot of eyes in terms of why is it outdated, how is it outdated, and, and let's, let's take this time now to change it. Meg, do you want to go next? Or? Sure. Uh, sure, Lynn, thanks. Um, I think something that I um, have tried since our last session was, um, I think really just trying to scale down assignments and be so intentional with what I'm asking of students. Um, I feel like each week um, I partner with my other humanities teacher, Wendy, and we just try to be so specific and in alignment so that um, everything that we do, every time we're together with kids, it's really intentional and um, and that clarity of what I want to do. And I feel like Don's talked about this in this meeting or in other meetings in the past, just like, so what that means though is the backfill is pretty intense, you know, like you are, um, you're really trying to, to, um, to make sure that your word, you pick your words wisely, you are clear on where the assignment is located, that kind of a thing. Uh, I tried Pear Deck, which was kind of fun because it was just a nice way to, um, you know, we have half hour meetings with kids and I don't have any way of really knowing how they're doing. So trying Pear Deck just allowed a little window of interaction um, that, I was, uh, that I was really psyched uh, about. And I think the only other uh, one thing that I've just, it's been sort of filling my bucket a little bit is, um, so we have Friday emails every Friday and we're really trying to ask, you know, really trying to hold kids to that because that's the one, you know, before Friday emails were to parents, were sharing up their week and what was happening at school. And now Friday emails are to me, telling me about what's happening at home. And so we started, I started uh, record. I started inviting kids to do a session um, with me one on one, and I would use my um, Google Meets and I would just record it. And so I've had so many kids sign up to do a recording of their Friday email as opposed to writing it. Um, they would just much rather have a chat. And um, and you know I've learned so. I love it because I get to ask them to clarify, tell me more about that, um, describe what you mean. What was the highlight of your week? What was the stuck point? Show me something. So they'll literally just like take a little, a little thing and put it up to the camera. And um, boy, I, I want to make sure that I continue to, to use that way of engaging with kids and reflecting on their weeks instead of always relying on the Friday email. So those have been two things that I've really, uh, really been enjoying. And uh, before we have uh, too many more uh, answers or go too much further, I'd like to, we have a special guest today, uh, Joe Rivers. Uh, Joe, Hi, how are you doing? And uh, Joe, feel free to join the conversation at any mm -hmm. time. We'd be, we'd love to hear how you're doing. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Lindsay, go ahead. Well, uh, so I'm kind of seeing a lot of things, but from an outside perspective, um, because uh, we're working with so many different school teams, middle school and high school teams throughout the state. And what has been um, really just inspiring is just um, the willingness for young people and their adult partners to want to engage in um, either continuing their work around transforming education or reimagining education through a variety of different angles, 
and or shifting their focus to really be um, thinking about um, being uh, what has this experience taught them about learning and teaching and um, and using that to really inform their decisions as they move into um, the summer and the fall. So just a couple of pieces I was thinking that I really was um, that have been really inspiring for me to see is I've been meeting weekly with one group. Um, they were a group that was focused on restorative practices in their school, youth adult team. And we've been meeting weekly on um, Google Meets um, to, to their, their, um, their broader theme of their project hasn't changed around like um, connections, community and relationships, but the way in which it, they've gone about it has certainly pivoted because of our um, circumstances and they've developed, um, they, they uh, took a survey of all the TA advisors to say, would you like some tips? Like we don't want to impose anything if you feel really good about what you're doing, but would you like some tips to support um, engagement in your TA, which is the one place where um, attendance was being recorded for the weeks. And they were noticing that young people weren't showing up or it's just becoming like a sign your name off on a list that you were there and that it was super awkward, that there wasn't protocols put in place so that people felt even more awkward about um, stepping into a conversation. So they surveyed the um, staff and the staff, like, I mean, it was basically 100% said yes. And so they've been developing these TA tips of the week that um, the, youth, um, the youth on the team have taken turns um, working on it throughout the week and then sending it out the Friday before because they do the TA on Monday. Um, and I just thought, what a brilliant pivot because it's so simple. They're basically providing TA, um, TA advisors with um, ideas for how to create a virtual circle. So like, here's some ways to create an order because what young people are saying is like, whereas before in class, it was incredibly awkward to speak up. Now it's even more awkward. And if I speak up, I'm now wasting everyone's time because they want to get outside, mm -hmm. right? So I don't even know like how to connect, you know? So, um, so all these lessons learned, you know, from listening to young people. So it, um, how to create a circle order, some protocols for really and being inclusive, um, so a couple of share questions a week that they put out there and a couple of games. And people have been very responsive to it. And now the principal of the school is really considering that as a template for how to um, infuse those tips into their classes, you know, because they're noticing the same thing in their classes too. This, you know, this, this, these same things. And, and to us as a team, we were like, no brainer. Like these are the things that should be happening um, throughout the day. But um, so that's been really inspiring. I also met with a Burktown um, middle school team this morning who's part of Cultivating Pathways to Sustainability. And I was really inspired by what I heard from their team about, um, how, you know, where they were before COVID with their projects and how they've shifted to continue the focus on their project work, but just in a really different way. And they, they also just to reflect on what Meg said, they've been continuing to set a goal each week around their project work and then reflect on it through an online um, uh, protocol. And um, I was just like blown away by the work that's continued. And, um, and that was just meeting with eight youth you know, and, I, and I'm sure there's lots of stories. Um, and then I've also just, you know, I've just had a lot of conversations with teams over, um, over these weeks. And it, it seems like, you know, the lessons that they're learning about who they are as a learner, what their needs are, how they're being addressed or not addressed, you know, they're really discovering a lot about themselves because they, this is something that none of us knew what, how we would react or understand about ourselves during this time. So I've just been really inspired. Um, it's really clear that from young people that small groups where it's, you know, people show up and it's, you know, like I see it even with my own daughter. She has small groups every day. She's in groups of five with literacy and math, depending on the day. It's peers, you know, it's differentiated in a way that is engaging for her. And, um, and to me, that's what I've heard from older learners, too, is like when it's small group and I really can be engaged, that's when it's been most successful. They can't envision going back to a class of 25, nor can I. Uh, thank you. That, I mean, you brought up so many good points there. Um, Maura, did you want to talk about some of the things that you're noticing? 
as in your role? Sure, yeah, I, um, you know, having sort of a K-12 perspective, it's been really interesting, actually pre-K-12, it's been really interesting thinking about each of the developmental levels and how teachers are sort of considering how to provide appropriate um, learning opportunities at each of those levels. I think um, in the middle level specifically, we're noticing a really high engagement um, with advisory and um, with whole school sort of community activities that are remote. Um, we're noticing that those are places that, you know, we know that students, um, those are really important places for students and our students are, you know, attending and engaging in advisory and connecting with their peers and requesting things like, can we have social spaces with our friends throughout the day? And, you know, I think that's a huge piece that's missing when we're in a physically distant world right now. And so it just sort of reminds us of the importance of those elements within a middle school and, and really considering how do we meet those those needs that students have, um, especially for our young adolescents. Um, I think the other um, pieces our teachers have been doing, um, just some really creative thinking about how they continue some of their theme work and project-based learning work with students and how that is so deeply engaging for students and really personalizing um, you know, either the topics or the way in which students are presenting and demonstrating their learning, that, you know, those are the most engaging for students. That's where students are showing up, um, which I think we know in the classroom context too, but it's just reinforced so much more um, in, this, in this setting. And then, um, and I think, you know, uh, Don and Kevin, you touched on this a little bit, it's that balance between the asynchronous and synchronous you know, like what are the things that we can have students do independently and what are the things that we need to do together and getting really clear on, you know, how do we have a variety of tools so that students are, you know, we're thinking about too the different ways in which our students learn and giving them a variety of options of how to and entry points of how to engage with um, the classroom material. And then I think lastly, um, Something that's been really helpful is, and this was kind of before the continuation of learning, but just really prioritizing. Um, in our context, we talk about, you know, prioritizing those proficiencies, but getting really clear on like, what are the key pieces that we want our students to walk away with at the end of the year. And I think that that has been a really helpful process. And I hope that that's something that continues like getting really, really even more crystal clear and almost narrowing, you know, what are the two or three things that we want to really target our instruction and design around um, for students. And so, um, so I think, you know, that that's just sort of my general reflection of things that um, things that we're learning from and that are going well. Thank you uh, very much. Um, did anybody have any other comments based on what you heard from uh, the contributors? I could. I, mean, I just, appreciate. Oh. Go ahead, Meg. I, just, I was just going to say thank you, Lindsay, for uh, posting that link. I'm psyched to take a look at that and see what that has. Kevin? I was just going to say, you know, to, to Maura's point that she just made, I feel like every you know, webinar or online meeting I've been on with different teachers. It's, it's this common thread of less is more right now. And, and again, I, I just so, I so hope that continues once, once we get back to, you know, to being physically together in school, just because like Morris said that this kind of notion and Meg and Lindsay, everybody has been talking about like having this more specific focus of, well, what do we really want kids to get out of this by the end without overdoing it? Like instead of just scratching the surface and everything, what's something we can really dig in, give them some rule like tools to explore and then just facilitate their learning. Um, again, that's, I'm, I'm just thinking about, again, what can we do to change school? Like let's not go back to normal. And, and I think it, it's, this has been such an aha for hopefully a lot of teachers who are stuck in this traditional rut of, wow, learning can still happen if I don't have 14 standards attached to everything I'm trying to grade. Mm -hmm. um, instead, you know, we're really thinking about the learning as a process and, and 
just being explicit about it. So I'm, I'm really grateful that those conversations keep happening. Great. Uh, just one one thing I'd like to add, just hearing uh, Lindsay talking about the uh, TA and also hearing Maura talking about the standards, I think there's a common thread in there and, and what everybody's kind of mentioned is the language that we're using with students. One of the things that I've noticed is so important when you're online and you're not able to kind of have that back and forth is being really clear with the language you're using when you're asking somebody to go somewhere and do something but also to be really uh, cognizant of the language we're using with students when we have them in the small groups and making sure that we're, I mean, I'm just trying to be as upbeat and positive and supportive in all my language, including feedback, which is a big thing, you know, a big thing for me right now is everything I'm trying to do is encouraging and using that kind of language. And this is where we start getting into the nuts and bolts, but you know, when, as Meg was saying, when you're trying to streamline, you're, you're collaborating and you're trying to really streamline what you want, we should be streamlining not only the standards, but also what we're asking for from kids. So it's, it needs to be very clear and specific and I think positive too. And uh, that's just something that I'm, you know, noticing and paying attention to. And, you know, it's just, again, this is the nuts and bolts, but when you, when you're presenting like an email to students, is your email very clear step by step? Is it as concise as possible so that you're not confusing kids? Are you using language that they understand? And are you giving them navigation assistance so that if they need to get somewhere, they can get somewhere without really, you know, where do I go for that? Which as you know, is a kind of a hallmark of uh, middle school kids in the first place. So how are we guiding them through that? Uh, Meg, our next section is about reflections and takeaways. You know, um, do you want to talk to us about that and particularly about the family piece? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the questions are, um, what activities or actions are you using to engage students, particularly in that advisory and small group um, or online setting? We talked a little bit about that, but maybe um, if there's something that folks want to add to that, uh, that would be great. Um, the other piece is how are we engaging families in this new uh, context? Uh, so I can share one little thing. Should I start or should I go around? Oh, okay. Um, so last night, um, and I think the timing of this uh, coincided with a conversation that I had with somebody. And so I think, have you have maybe Swift House has also done something like this where we we hosted a parent night uh, last night. Uh, we had a slideshow that just had some questions on it about, um, hey, you know, kind of letting parents know that um, that we're in this together. That it, you know, it's a there's a huge difference between being homeschooled and online learning, and what this is and what it isn't. Um, and just thank you. Um, you know, to build on what Don was saying about that positivity, like really trying to bolster parents as well to help them um, speak the same language. I can speak to this in my household. I know that um, when Mark, uh, he came out of me for saying that every time when Mark checks in with, with the boys, it's like, uh, hey, you doing okay? You need anything? You're all set with your school. And, and it's this sort of big overarching general check-in. But when I check in and I say something like, did you do the warm up on your math slide? Or did you uh, do you, you know, Sammy, did you stop and jot on your reading log? Because we're speaking the same language, uh, it's, a, it's more effective. So I get a little bit clearer response from my children about what's going on. And so some of those tools we shared with families last night, where do you find the stuff? Where are their assignments? Not that they are responsible for it, but just to help them Speak the same language, um, and so we we didn't have a ton of families, but it was just nice to to reach out to them to hear what their concerns are, um, and uh, and then the only other thing is uh, I'm trying to do parent conferences or student led conferences um, a little bit, and um, I've had two so far. And that's gone that's gone pretty well. So those are some ideas. Have you want to share what you guys did at at um, in Swift House? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, th I think we try to get it before the April break. You know, we were obviously just 
realizing like we felt overwhelmed by the amount of emails we were getting and we felt like parents were getting overwhelmed because not only were they getting stuff from us but they were getting stuff from the district and of course like anybody who subscribed to anything you got an email from every single company to tell you what they're doing to combat COVID so a lot of parents were like honestly we can't keep up like it's so like your stuff goes in the weeds and and for us you know <laughs> teachers sent on email were like ours is the most important thing you need to look at and that's not always the reality so you know, we, we just kind of talked as a team. We said, you know what, it would be great if we could just get everybody to the table at once, go over what our schedule is going to look like, talk about, you know, why we're doing things the way we're doing it, um, talk about different opportunities. Um, we had about 65 families show up, which is awesome. We recorded it and sent it out to the rest um, for you know people who couldn't make it. And again, it was, we did a similar thing. We just kind of put together, we called it our parent curriculum slash connection night. Um, it was just an opportunity for us to, to have them see all of the teachers and hear from us and hear our plan. Um, and then at the end, we fielded questions. And it was, we got such great feedback about that. And, and it really just, it felt great to see the parents again too. Like, you know, we miss our kids, but we miss you know, the families and the community there. But it was just such a great opportunity just to kind of clear everything up, put everybody, you know, so we're all on the same page. Um, I think a lot of people felt really tense at that leading up to that and then after they heard from us it, it really eased a lot of anxieties um, especially with with uh, parents with students on IEPs or, or getting other services just in terms of you know we were very explicit that our priorities were to connect with kids first like first and foremost we just want to connect like we're not really worried about assessment right now it's just, we're just giving you know yeah. connecting and giving some feedback um, and then they asked some great questions at the end that we fielded uh, and and it, it, yeah, it was it was awesome. And we're planning on doing not like another formal one, but um, we have some like our end of the year traditions coming up with like independent projects. We're trying to set up a virtual open house using Flipgrid, and our eighth graders are still going to do um, a presentation. So we're going to do like an informal, just tell parents, hey, we're going to be online at this date from like six to seven p.m. Here's the topics we're going to talk about. If you want to come on board and listen in, great. We'll record it. And if you have questions, bring them there. So it's, again, we're going to keep that one really informal. Like we're not putting the other slideshow. It's really just going to be a chance for us to say, you know, instead of looking through all the emails that we're trying to update you with, one-stop shop, pop in. We can talk about it. You can hear from us about some end of the year stuff. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that, again, that'll answer a lot of questions that parents are trying to figure out right now. That's great. That's great. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Don, do you want to share what's happening for your? Uh, yeah, I just had a qu I had a question for Kevin. What platform are you using for the? Uh, is it just a Google Meet or how are you doing that? Well, yeah. So I mean, with I think a lot of schools are seeing this, but we're not allowed to use Zoom with our students. We have to use Google Meets. Um, we use Zoom for this because it was with the parents and. Again, at the time, I know Google Meet's come up with a lot of new additions since, but at the time, like we really needed the waiting room. Uh, we needed the ability to mute people from the, whoever starts it, our end. We needed to know like we could record it and it was going to work well um, and the, the screen sharing setting. So at that point in time, we were more confident with what Zoom could do. You know, we love Google Meets to use for our kids, but in terms of, you know, we've used Zoom for our webinars and I was like, all right, I know we can record this. Um, the parents were great too. So one thing, if, if you're going to do it, I would advise is we just uh, pick one of our facilitators to be in charge of the chat bar. So we see the parents, like as we're talking, like please stay muted, but any questions you have, put them in the chat bar and then we would address them as we go, as we were still talking. Because um, some of them were just quick questions and also allowed, you know, we told parents and families, we said, if you have a specific question about your kid, you know, Zoom allows you to ask you know, specifically just to the facilitators. Um, whereas, you know, other questions you might want everybody to see, but you can't do that on Google Meets either. So we got a little slap on the wrist because we didn't clear it with admin. They ended up being okay with it, but they said next time just check in with us first. Um, so we'll check in with them before our next one. But Zoom ended up working really well for it. And I, sorry to be a little t tech head here, but uh, and where do you post the videos for, uh, for parents? Oh, so like the recording? Yeah, yeah. So if somebody can't make the meeting, but they want to look at the recording, where is that posted? Yeah, so we, we have our uh, 
remote learning site, we put it there. We also send out home a weekly flyer with our blog, which is something that we've always done. So we put it in there as well. Um, and then we, yeah, we just emailed everybody just to thank them for being there and put the link for anybody who couldn't make it. Um, I mean, that, <clears throat> that sounds awesome. The, uh, I think that we, I've, let me sort of step back for a second. I think that what's really become apparent to me and something <clears throat> that I'm working on right now is developing a communication plan that's consistent and that has routine and that is easily accessible by, <clears throat> by parents and families. And so I think Kevin, everybody was getting bombarded by emails and you learn really quickly that you have to have a fixed communication plan and how important that is. So now we, we send one email out to parents on Mondays and I try and schedule it. So it comes out at the same time. And that email is very simple, but in that email, I have links to, Hey, here's our week ahead, which is like a PDF. So if you want to explore a little bit deeper, then you can explore what's in there. And then I also uh, make a, a little uh, Google slideshow of what's happening in the week. These are the learning opportunities. And that's posted on our website and that's updated with the daily learning opportunities so that people can access that if they want to. And then we've also done a little bit with the social media uh, where we created a team Facebook group um, and we just kind of are posting stuff there. And then we also have a Twitter and we're, you know, posting there as well. And I, um, you know, I haven't, uh, I haven't examined all of the perspectives about this, but, I think, and I mentioned this before, one of the most successful things that we did at the beginning of the year, uh, beginning of the disruption, the COVID was we create, we had a team Gmail account. So if you talk to your administrators, they can get a, a, a team email account. So for us, it's dynamics 802 at whatever at Gmail. And that gives you access to a YouTube channel. And so we just had everybody subscribe to the YouTube channel. And I had asked kids about that, you know, and and I've said this before, but they're like, go to YouTube because everybody can access YouTube on any device. You don't need a subscription. And then all you do is subscribe to a playlist. So we have one playlist. We could probably have more, but we have one playlist. So every time something's published, you get a notification on that. And so it's, it's fairly simple, um, but it's made us, it's made me at least realize how much video I need to be producing. And that's led me down another rabbit hole of how do I communicate effectively in videos to my students and to the families as well. So I think that, um, okay, I think the uh, communication plan is, uh, is really essential. And then just making sure that you're available to, you know, to the families on a regular basis. I'm always reminding the families, be in touch via email. And another thing that I, I've done is I've gone on to Google Voice and uh, I've created a Google Voice account that has a number that people can text to. And once it texts to that number, you can filter it. So then it comes right to your, uh, your school email. So they have a number that's, you know, not your personal number, but it just forwards. And that way you can say, hey, you can reach me by text. You can reach me by email, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, again, I've, I've sort of been thinking about it from that communication side. Um, but I think that what you talked about that virtual uh, parent night or open house night, that sound, that's a dynamic idea. And I think that that's something that uh, is gonna be really important moving forward. Um, Linz, or you wanna jump in next with that lens of a small group? Advisor, you talked about advisors to maybe the parent lens of engagement. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I don't have like a, a lot more to add, but what I can say as a parent and, mm -hmm. um, and what I'm noticing from the, the groups that I'm working with, um, as a parent, I feel like um, uh, I, I'm really uh, inspired by the work that you and Kevin have done to engage families in that way. Um, and I, I think that's such a great idea. I, I noticed from my daughter's teacher, she offers times for us all to connect, you know, just to tech, check in together. Um, her combination of small group and large group and Padlets and Flipgrids has really kept my daughter who's nine, you know, engaged to an extent. I mean, I think it's getting old for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. 
uh, and uh, and just the, you know, the fact that I have access to the Google Classroom that my daughter has, you know, so I see the, the weekly trail map is what they get and, um, and that guides their work. That's really helpful for me, but it's just that knowing that, um, you know, if I have a, a question that, or if we want to get on a, a, a Google Hangout or a Zoom, we can do that. And just, it's just been pretty uh, amazing. And I feel like um, it's, you know, I don't know if this is another way, what we're finding in our organization, because let me, I'll extend it a little further out. Some of our programs have continued to pursue, for instance, our getting to why teams are, many of them still continue to have a community dialogue or community engagement event. And we put together a resource to hold those, you know, how to do this virtually. And, and it's been really successful that you can engage. In fact, I think, and maybe we talked about this last time, we might, this might be a level of more equitable engagement when we can offer um, a virtual way to have a community event because we know that not everyone works um, a school, school day hours nor nine to five hours, nor is their home life maybe in a place where they can take an hour long break and get on a Zoom. I mean, there's other responsibilities. So, um, either being able to record something and have people contribute in that way or have some kind of online dialogue through a different tool. Um, we've been finding that to be very useful in engaging folks that maybe would not have been able to show up at the actual school building. So I, I think it offers a lot of opportunity, especially like with Meg and Kevin, if you had those events and then you were able to record them, people can go back later and listen in, grab the little tidbits they want. I think that we're noticing ways to um, uh, broaden our engagement and maybe engage those that don't necessarily have um, the schedules, the desire, or the resources to get into the school building. Um, and I think that's one of the pieces we've always said. And now, you know, we're finding new ways to engage families. I, I love that idea of the open house. I think um, one of the things that we've been hearing, we've been um, asking for a lot of feedback from our families and a general theme, I would say that our families have um, are, you know, one wanting to know that their kids are doing what they're supposed to be doing um, and that the parents doing an okay job. Um, I think there's some reassurance uh, needs that are there too. Um, and, and then also really wanting to know, you know, is my child where they need to be for next year? Like, that's a big question that I think as we're coming towards the end of the year that we're hearing a lot. And so I love that idea of doing like the student led conferences and things like that. Um, I think that's really, really crucial. And, you know, as we start to think about next year, what are the, what is the information that we need from families and from different stakeholders now so that we can plan for both in person or remote, but just how, how can we use this moment where families have a different look inside um, school, even though we're not within the building, mm -hmm. how can we get the feedback from families so that no matter what our contact text is next year, that we're better meeting their needs and we're get, getting really clear on what it is that they, they need. Um, in thinking about um, some of the things that we've been doing to engage families at the middle level. Um, at PAML, they do whole school gatherings, and now those include um, family members as well. And so parents and students log in, and um, it's really a celebration of, um, it's a really, you know, it's a celebration of things that are going on. I think last week they did a school-wide kahoot with trivia about yeah. each of the teachers and just thinking about like new ways to engage parents would have never had the opportunity to sit with their child and do something like that if we were in a physical school building right. and so it's just thinking about you know how do we use um, these opportunities and also how do we think about time because right now we're, we're able to sort of schedule things at any time or um, you know the thought of doing a six o'clock call with families is a little bit easier because I, you've been home or, you know, you, you rearrange things for your afternoon. And so, you know, I think, I hope that those are some of the things that we keep with us. 
Yeah. I, uh, Maura, can I just tie one thing that you said with uh, something that Lindsay mentioned as a parent now? Um, our uh, oldest daughter is in uh, fourth grade and she, her teacher offered a, like a 20 minute meet. It was the family and the student and the teacher. And I just found that to be so helpful because we were able to talk to the teacher and say, hey, this is what our kid's experiencing. This is how she's behaving you know, these are some of her character traits in regards to working and making sure she gets stuff done. And I think um, what we're seeing is that this is so personal. And if you can make your engagement with the family personal, you can start dialing in uh, what each kid needs. And, and actually, I think you can make your whole practice more effective. If you have mm -hmm. a parent tell you, hey, I didn't know where to get that assignment or mm -hmm. I didn't know how to do that. My kid was, and all of a sudden you're like, okay, I need to find another way to do that. And I just really appreciated the opportunity to sit down and talk with the teacher and uh, our family talking to the teacher and just saying, you know, here's what's going well. Here's what we have some questions about. And, and then having the kid have the opportunity to, to say, you know, how they're feeling, but also just to connect on that level and to be, you know, so appreciative of what's happening. And then just the one thing that I'm really concerned with uh, is that the longer this goes, uh, the more stress, it kind of there's a long-term stress that's being uh, yeah. placed not only on children, but on families. And I think that uh, I'm, I'm starting to feel that stress. And I think I'm starting to see that stress in general. Um, and I just think that we need to tread so carefully and so lightly with all of our families because we have no idea what each individual mm -hmm. situation is like. So in the same way that we can differentiate how we're meeting with those families, I think we just have to just be so kind and so careful because we just don't know what's going on with each family and how they're dealing with the situation. And it's just so important to lead with kindness and understanding and to just, I, I don't know, that's just the disposition I'm taking because I feel like there's a long-term stress event and we're not really sure how it's going to shake out. So something to consider when you're talking to families. Um, I really appreciate that. I just want to add one little thing because it's making me think a little bit about it is this, this idea of forward thinking. Um, um, because uh, so in my conversations with my students this week in their small, uh, in their like student led conference, um, just ask them a series of questions, but one was about um, what have you learned about yourself as a learner that might translate for you when we are back in face-to-face? -face? Like, is there something that you're learning about who you are as a learner that um, you might rely on whatever comes next? And, um, and it's been really interesting to hear um, to hear what kids are saying about that, but also um, the that idea of encouragement of, um, you know, we as teachers pivoted, but students had to pivot, you know, and then some, right? And just the fact that they've been in this for so many weeks, and and each week they get a little bit more clarity about how they're learning or what the systems are that they need to be successful or how to reach out to teachers to, um, to feel empowered that the, we assume so much functioning on them, um, you know, uh, on a dime, you know, it's just like, boom, you're in this. And um, I agree. I, I just want to, I want to celebrate how much they're learning about themselves right now as learners and also empower them that this learning, no matter where they are next year, um, whether it's face-to-face -face or in remote, is, is that's going to sustain them. You know, they're, they're, they'll be able to, to rely on that in the next phases, whatever this is. I, I think that's an excellent point. And as you were talking, I was thinking about the importance of transferable skills and how we've been talking about how much we need to support kids with the transferable skills so that they can, when something like this happens, they can actually manage. And uh, I think that also sort of ties into, I'm gonna ask that we, uh, we have about 10 minutes left and I'd, I'd like us to kind of combine our last two topics, which are 
you know, how are we going to end this school year? What are we thinking about ending the school year? Because we got new clarity on that from uh, Secretary French on last Friday. And uh, then the other question is, it's kind of a looming question that that's not very clear, is what are teachers and practitioners and administrators and community folks and community organizations, how are you moving forward into what is not really a clear future right now? And what are some strategies that you're thinking about or moving forward with so that you're prepared uh, for whatever, whatever comes up? And why don't we start with Lindsay and then uh, Kevin. Joe, if you want to pitch in, that'd be great. Uh, Maura and then Meg. So um, from a community organization perspective that our, our work is to, we, you know, we felt like, you know, um, this, this work doesn't have to be done in a building, doesn't have to be done in a place. It's work that just needs to happen. And so we felt really um, well poised um, to continue working with our teams and still feel um, really um, like this work will continue. I don't know, it will look different. Um, but, you know, we, we have been able to um, continue meeting regularly with our school teams who want to do the work of reimagining education, of transforming education. Like Meg said, there are so many lessons that young people are learning about themselves. There are so many lessons that educators are learning about themselves. There are so many lessons that parents are learning about, you know, ourselves that um, if we can, I, I just don't think that we can take that and like put it over here because we're not, we're not like going back, you know, like um, how do we move forward from this and, um, and look at it with a new, a new way and look at it with, you know, um, this has not been easy. This is not okay. What we've all been experiencing, young people, elders, all of us in between. And what lessons can we take that will move us forward about schools? Schools have not changed very much in a very long time. And now is the opportunity, you know, to really look at the lessons learned and reflect and say, what is it that I can bring back into um, the fall? And I mean, I don't think it really, yes, it matters. It matters a lot for young people because they thrive off of social connections that their, their whole developmental, you know, like the, the whole part of their development is about feedback from peers and being in groups and, um, and that's really hard, you know, and I hope that we'll be able to get back to being in proximity with each other, um, in community with one another. Um, we will, we just don't know when, and I don't think we can start to predict when it's going to happen. So knowing that, how can we continue with this work, um, and this really good work that's happening? I mean, I just heard so many amazing things, you know, I mean, it's like, there's so much good that's happening. And it's really hard, but how can we ensure that we're not just doing, um, I think someone said like online, like we're not teaching online, like just basically translating what happened in the classroom to an online platform, which I did not hear, but really being um, innovative and looking at what does it mean to learn at home? And, and how can I really, again, like we've got all, we've got the proof of policy. We know that in Vermont, let's, let's go. You know, it's like, we've got the proof of policy. We, you know, um, we, we've, we have lots of reflection and lessons learned. Let's, let's continue. And let's not try to predict when we're, we're gonna be back to whatever, let's just go. Thank you. Kevin? Um, yeah, so to address the first part of your question, for any year stuff, um, you know, we've been looking at this in two different ways. One is just school-wide, and I think that's, being adjusted as we hear more from Secretary French. I know as of right now, we're planning on uh, the admins putting on eighth grade graduation uh, with recordings of all the speeches, and then they're setting up some sort of drive-by with handing off certificates in a safe way. So that's all in the works, but obviously like that changes on a week-to-week -week basis, depending on what the new protocols are. Um, so I'm glad that that's now out there at least and something that we can start telling our eighth graders about. Um, Team-wide, you know, we're, you know, we have so many of these end of the year traditions that uh, everybody has end of the year traditions that they're missing out on. Uh, that's not specific, just us, it's everybody. Uh, but for us, you know, we are doing our independent projects that are more like passion projects that kids are doing. And so we always had this at the last week of school, a big open house where, you know, we'd have almost 200 people come in, parents and community members, 
and it was like a little poster symposium where kids would have their trifolds and, and talk about their projects. So we're trying to, you know, figure out what that's going to look like online, if we can use Flipgrid so they can be sharing what they learned and get feedback from community members on that. Um, we're still going to have our eighth graders do their more formal eighth grade challenge presentation. Uh, we're looking actually for adult panelists to come in. Uh, we typically have four or five from the community to listen in. So if anybody's interested in hearing about some of the eighth grade challenge and want to give some feedback, let me know. Um, so that's stuff that we're doing on, on team that, again, we're trying to figure out what we can do uh, to keep those traditions alive. And, and so far, the kids are excited hearing about the possibilities for it. Um, and then, yeah, the looking forward, I think, you know, I agree with everything that's been said so far. And you know, I just keep saying this. I don't want this notion to be like, let's get back to normal. I want school to get back to normal. I really want this to be an opportunity for us to change, you know, what school is, what instruction means, what learning means. Um, Cause I, I, we just, we need to change. And, you know, we need to give kids more room for exploration and kind of learning at their own pace and us being able to facilitate that exploration and be there to facilitate their learning. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm always, I'm nervous that it's just going to, it is going to go back to normal because that feels safe and it's just what we've known for hundreds of years at this point. And it's, you know, I, I hope admin is going to be willing to come to the table with teachers and especially teachers who are excited about changing it and listen to see what it might look like if we do change it and not just say, you know, let's go back to normal. So I'm really hopeful that some of the people who get to make those decisions will come to the table. Um, and, and yeah, I, I don't, like Lindsay was just talking about like this whole notion of let's not just, I, I keep going back to the SAMR model and technology. Like you know, I don't want us to just be substituting or augmenting what we do in the classroom just right now, but like instead let's get to that MR, that modify and redesign phase. You know, let's not just say this is what we did in the classroom. Now let's do it online. You know, at some points, yes, there's a, always a room for that, but let's, let's take this as an opportunity to, to, shift it in another direction in terms of what, you know, using some of these online tools can look like just to help with connections. Uh, Maura? Yeah, I, just to echo what uh, Lindsay and Kevin are saying, I think it's so important that as we're thinking about next year, whatever our context is, we're really thinking about, you know, what are the things, and I think Meg has been saying this too, like, what have we learned about our learners? What have we learned about ourselves? What have we learned about our school, schools as systems now that we've had to step away? Um, you know, we've had to do some, re some really quick reimagining. And so now that we're in sort of our marathon, how do we reimagine um, for sustainability? And really think about how, what are the, the pieces that we want to carry with us? I think, um, you know, in terms of thinking about the fall specifically, um, it can feel really hard even considering thinking about the fall because we don't have answers. Like there, there isn't a concrete and this is the day that this thing is gonna happen or um, something like that. And so um, I'll share a resource, but um, Education Elements, which is a, um, an organization that I, I've, get a lot of resources from they have a plan sort of like charting a pathway to next fall and really thinking about like what are the different options that we have and what are the leverage points so that we're really thinking about like what are those really high impact leverage point things that we're, we want to think about and put our energy into for the summer so that when we go back whether it's in person or a hybrid or you know remote learning we're keeping those those key pieces that um, we can use to really transform learning for our students and for our families and for our community. And so um, I'll link that in as well, but that just helped sort of ground me in thinking about, you know, how do we chart a path forward? Thank you very much. Uh, Joe, did you want to add anything? Meg? Uh, sure. Um, you know, this is a new year uh, for us on a new team. So we didn't have a chance really to build some traditions. Um, we are trying to, um, to immerse in a little bit of a time capsule. So we're asking kids to build uh, elements to contribute to a time capsule of capturing what's happening right now, using the skills uh, that we've been practicing all year. Um, but uh, I just want to say something about um, about that opportunity for reflection at the end of the year because 
we've been talking about uh, planning for the Middle Grades Institute. And to be honest, I've been worried about how our teachers going to have the capacity to uh, come to the Institute. Um, and Kevin, listening to you speak just gave me uh, this great uh, hope and inspiration for, for MGI because um, we can get as educators and really unpack the year and use that frame of, of, um, of problem solving strategy, of emphasizing, you know, where have we been and where are options coming next and how can we design, design that? It just gave me this like great hope, like, yes, we can do like we could we can do this and I didn't think I had the capacity to be able to do it because I've been so overwhelmed right now but now I feel like I can do it so thank you for that I appreciate it Kev so I think Meg just hearing you say that uh, one of the things I maybe I appreciate this group so much is that it gives me a time to reflect where I'm not I'm able to step out of my you know the kind of the hamster wheel and and really think about what's happening and you know, one of the things I'm considering, uh, and, and Lindsay said this too, this proof of policy, like how important is the PLP now where you have that online where you can be uh, posting all your evidence and as a teacher, you can be checking in with your kids portfolio online to see how they're doing. And for me, how important is this development of these micro credentialing ideas where you can, you can throw a whole um, variety of learning activities that are based on proficiencies out there and then kids can go out and do the ones they're engaging in and earn micro credentials and post those to their PLP. And then the third thing that I've really been thinking about a lot is partnering with community organizations. Right now we have a couple kids who are trying to do a uh, recycle at home compost at home video with the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District. And so, you know, the things in our lives that are continuing are continuing in a different way. And how can we incorporate community partners who not only serve as uh, they can serve as adult role models, but they can also provide lots of opportunities for uh, uh, teachers and programs that and you can build your relationships with those organizations over time. And so then all of a sudden you're as Kevin was mentioning this transformation. It's not just me who's responsible for the curriculum and what's being taught, but all of a sudden you're pulling in from all over your community. Uh, to, you know, to get different ideas and resources and people and that's giving kids uh, more window into the into the world. And the last thing I'll say is that I'm just still so concerned about the kids who who aren't engaging and the kids who are being left behind. And of all of this, I think it's just become so clear the inequity. We've talked about this before, right? is that this has just bared the inequity. It's made it so clear uh, where the gaps are in our, in our schools and how do we get those kids who, you know, who are struggling, how do we reach out to them and get them when we don't have that uh, connection, that face-to-face -face connection and how can we be, you know, and, and then another point too is, is, you know, when kids, if kids do come back and we're face-to-face, -face, how are we gonna be dealing uh, humanely with all these kids and families who have undergone all this stress and trauma and who may be experiencing a very different life than from the last time that we saw them. Right. And so thinking about that and, and weaving that into our disposition so that we're a welcoming, engaging, interesting, and effective organization to move kids forward to where they need to be in what could be or what is a very changed world. So those are things that I'm thinking about. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, worried about it. The the biggest thing that I'm, I just want to see the kids, you know, like I miss just kind of the back and forth day to day, you know, the, the repartee with the kids, you know, um, and that's, that's something I, I'm deeply missing. Uh, we have like two minutes left and I know that there's some great events happening and I want to make sure we give time for that. Uh, Lindsay, do you want to talk about your power Two conference that's happening tomorrow? Yeah. Um, tomorrow is our sixth, uh, annual Powered Squared Summit. And um, it's the first time it's been virtual and it should be really excellent. And um, it's free, it's from nine to 12. We have uh, really amazing teams of youth and adults that are gonna be sharing their transformational work. Um, and there'll be, it's really an opportunity to share 
and have dialogue. There'll be open conversations that people can choose to select into. Um, our opening will be facilitated by um, our, our youth uh, and adult planners. Um, and it should be a great morning. So, and it's really um, set up in a way that you can drop in and out. Like if you look at the agenda, you can come to the opening and then you could come to a session. Um, so it's different Zooms you'll be popping in and out of. Um, we have a DJ, a youth DJ, um, who will be uh, hosting a dance party before our finale. So, and I would encourage you to share it with any youth that might be interested too. Um, and, uh, and hopefully folks can make it. So that's tomorrow. Um, the, the theme of it is uh, really all about all this stuff. It's about, you know, connect, share, and inspire, and how can we reimagine and transform education together? And what, what do we need to do to um, make learning in the wor world better for all? And so um, it's really an apropos time, and um, it'll be really great just to see who shows up. And because it's virtual, we'll have folks from all over the country, which we are really psyched about. So it broadens the conversation. And then also next week, um, next week, next Friday, a week from tomorrow, um, is our Cultivating Pathways to Sustainability uh, final um, gathering. Usually we hold it at Shelburne Farms and this year it'll be on Zoom. And we're really psyched about um, how that's shaping up as well. We'll have teams from many of our schools that attended. Um, we have some keynoters uh, presenting from um, Burlington City and Lake semester and Burktown. We'll then have these breakout opportunities for cross-team dialogue just to talk about learning during this time and the sustainable development goals and it'll be short 10 to 12 and we're really psyched just to bring teams back together so those are some things that are on top for me right now awesome uh as meg mentioned uh the middle grades institute is happening i think it's june 22nd to 26th that'll be uh and there's actually uh for those who are participating uh there's a second a uh, few days to consult and to get action research projects going Really looking forward to that, uh, especially you know hearing all these great ideas and and knowing more probably about what the fall is going to bring. So that's a great opportunity too. Does anybody have any other opportunities uh, they want to share before we close? This one social one. Uh, Kyle Chadburn's doing like a live performing series tomorrow through the JP Quarantine series. So if anybody wants to hear as close to live music as we can get with one of our fellow educators, he'll be doing that tomorrow at eight o'clock. Awesome. Hey, everybody, thank you so much for all your contributions. The year has ended much differently than it started, that's for sure, but everybody continues to serve up innovative ideas that benefit kids, families, in the state of Vermont. I deeply appreciate it. Thanks to Middle Grades Collaborative for supporting this work. Get outside and enjoy the sunshine, everybody. Thank you dearly. I appreciate it, and have a wonderful uh, next few days, and good luck with your conference tomorrow, Lindsay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Hi, Joe, everyone. for visiting. Well. Take care, everybody. Take care.